On today's World Insight with Ken Wei. We have to persuade the American people that know knowledge is a good thing. Our exclusive interview with former U.S. Secretary of Defense, William Cohen, as we examine America's march toward protectionism. And Canada has been hit hard by America first. With NAFTA still hanging in the air, what's Canada's aspiration when seeking solutions? Free trade is really important to Canada. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. Today, we are going to discuss the ever-changing United States. What's wrong with the traditional American values? President Donald Trump's ambition to make America great again has spread unilateralism and protectionism far across the U.S. border. This has triggered geopolitical conflicts like the ongoing trade war between China and the U.S. What is missing between China and the U.S. policymakers? I recently sat down with William Cohen, former U.S. Secretary of Defense. He's Republican, but worked for the Clinton administration. With his unique charisma, he's still well-respected by both parties on the Capitol Hill. Before our interview, take a look at this. War on protectionism continues. The Chinese government has released a white paper about the trade relationship between China and the U.S. Monday. It provided figures to demonstrate how bilateral trade has been mutually beneficial and reiterated the importance of mutual trust and cooperation. The document accuses the Trump administration of abandoning international trade norms of mutual respect and equal consultations and of preaching unilateralism, protectionism and economic hegemony. The white paper concluded that China will continue to define its position on the situation, saying economic globalization is an international trend and that trade protectionism goes against the current. Also on Monday, Trump's threatened tariffs on another 200 billion U.S. dollars worth of Chinese imports took effect, escalating a trade war between the world's top two economies. The two countries have already slapped tariffs of $50 billion worth of each other's goods earlier this year. New import duties imposed by the U.S. this year affect roughly half of Chinese exports to the United States, with American consumers set to bear the brunt. Trump has hit 12% of total U.S. imports this year alone. Defiant in the face of increasing fears about the impact on the U.S. economy, Trump has threatened to go after all imports from China if the country refuses to change policies he says harm the U.S. industry. Various radical policies made by President Trump have caused widespread controversy and opposition inside the U.S. government. In recent years, the political landscape in the U.S. has become more fractured, polarized and volatile. The polarization within U.S. politics is also reflected in divided opinions towards Sino-U.S. ties. When you look at the near picture, yes. the long term could always be beautiful because we don't have to deal with them right now. But the near term future seem to be a little bit worrisome. Strategies coming from both sides we don't know, but what do you think could be some of the options rather that the two sides can look at? Well, there are a number of things. Alongside that I heard. <laughs> there are a number of things that we can do. What, what has happened uh, with respect to our relationship? Uh, we have stood, I think, I speak for many Americans, stood in awe of what the Chinese people have been able to achieve in such a very short time. Awe and admiration. Mm -hmm. Also some envy and, and jealousy and resentment. The resentment has come about and because there is a sense on the part of the people who have lost out in terms of globalization has been successful in lifting millions of Chinese people and others all over the world up out of poverty. So there have been many winners. And the Chinese people like to talk win-win solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, with globalization, there's also winners and losers. And so the people who have lost their jobs, lost their futures, mm -hmm. lost their hope, 
have been feeding on the resentment and send pointing fingers. And so these are the folks who now have been uh, politically active mm -hmm. uh, that uh, President right. Trump is looking to for his, uh, quote, base support. Uh, and we have ignored them in the past. That's um, both Republicans and Democrats have said, well, we're more interested in promoting globalization and we haven't really focused on their needs. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, in the future as we go forward, how do we address those issues? But getting back to what can we do, there is a sense that the system is in, out of balance right now. Which system? Our current trading system. I see. Um, President Trump has identified the problem, but he's come up with the wrong, I think, the wrong solution. Which they, is tariffs. Which is tariffs. I don't know many people in the business, certainly in the business of understanding trade, who believe that tariffs are a good thing, that they're a, tra a tariff war is a positive thing. Both countries and both peoples will lose out. There is a, a way to try to look at structural reform, however, and that would mean why don't um, uh, American companies or Western companies have the same opportunity to come into China and buy Chinese companies? Chinese companies, and we have represented some of them, come into the United States and they can buy American companies with some questions about But that is not likely to be iron out for the negotiation no, not, coming up? Not for, the, not, not for immediately, but within the near, near term, that can be done. But near term is important, uh, Secretary Nothing Kong, as you may know. If the atmosphere keep on getting ever worse, of course, even 200 billion is not necessarily going to be a, that big a number when it comes to the size of the economy of both countries. But it certainly indicates how the relationship will be shaped in a way for the future. That is uh, what yes, is important right That now. is true. And the next two months are not going to be dispositive on that issue. So what I'm saying is you can have a different uh, trading arrangement with American companies and buying Chinese companies. Also this notion of reciprocity. Uh, Alibaba is one of your top companies. They can work, uh, operate in the United States. Uh, Apple Pay can operate here. How come? So there are things that can be Huawei done. Huawei cannot operate with the 5G network in the United States. Neither does ZTE. How oh. come? That is also the question coming from the Chinese ZTE side. ZTE has, in fact, uh, been allowed to continue to operate. Thank you, uh, pres President However, Trump there has been a special representative coming from the U.S. side into the Chinese company. That has been a big debate in China as well. Now, if you keep contradicting me, you see that's, that's the problem with the United States <laughs> and China. <laughs> you're very good. Debate is good, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Secretary It's very good, Go and you're very good. But uh, in the short term, um, very little will probably change. Uh, I think following the midterm elections, you mm -hmm. may see a change in the composition of Congress. That might make a difference. I'm not saying it will, but I think the most people understand that trade wars are not good for us, not good for you or not good for us. And I think there still will be a core group of people who will see to it that the two biggest economies in the world cannot collide with each other and either then survive and prosper in a way they otherwise could. So I think we are, will have to make compromises. Mm -hmm. I think uh, certainly that is why we are here. That is why the Chinese uh, delegations have been coming to Washington. I hosted one of them before I came. Uh, so we're going to try our best to say that uh, we have our differences. Uh, we can make changes in the way we do business mm -hmm. to make it fairer. Uh, in terms of more balance so that American companies can feel they're receiving reciprocal treatment and China can feel the same way about coming to the United States. But we have to make a commitment to do that. That's just on okay. the trade issues. Then there's something called the military. Military can upset everything. If we don't resolve uh, military uh, differences, strategic mm -hmm. differences, then all the talk about uh, more trade, balanced trade, is really for naught uh, right. in the event there's a conflict Secretary between the Kong, United States. As you may know much better than I do when you're in Washington, that there are those who are already talking about some of the fundamental interests which has been laid out there from the very beginning of the bilateral relations, for example, about Taiwan, about some of the other uh, sensitive issues between China and the United States, use that as a bargaining chip. That, you may know, is a very dangerous road to walk ahead. Secretary Cohen, many people ask here, really, how many of those in the decision-making process about China-U.S. relations right now, in the White House or in Washington as a whole, really know much 
about what China U.S. has gone through in order to be where we are. On the other hand, do they have listening ears to words coming from you, for example, and some of the others who understand fundamentally how this relationship is working? Again, it comes back to part of the problem that we have in the United States. There is not a uh, deep bench, so to speak, of knowledge of China, its history, its culture, its interests. Uh, many of those who are knowledgeable have been relegated to, quote, elite, and therefore not to be trusted. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that we have an obligation to overcome, that we have to persuade the American people that, no, knowledge is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's not something to be denigrated. Uh, having uh, cultural exchanges, cultural knowledge of each other is a good thing. Um, uh, one of your leaders, uh, Wang Shishan, is uh, uh, fond of quoting Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. and he said that travel makes narrow-mindedness impossible. So it's really important that members of Congress uh, and leaders travel to various countries, and China in particular, to understand the history of China, its culture, its interests, and what it sees as its uh, vision for the future. Mm. But what if some believe in Thucydides' trap? Meaning, when the rising power, incumbent power, definitely to have a war, and therefore, no matter what we do, the Chinese are going to take away what we had, and it's going to be called the so-called imbalance, the American way. And therefore, these kind of uh, you know, discussions, it's not going to function at all. Well, isn't that... If that is the fundamental belief of some. Yeah, but isn't that the, the burden of... Uh, of a knowledge society is to say that we, we know history, we know ha what has happened in history, we know that the history and the arc of history of mankind has been more warfare than less, and so can we learn that there have been studies done out of the 16 major uh, studies of the Thucydides trap as such, 12 of the 16 ended up in war. And warfare in today's, with today's technology, uh, simply, uh, it's unthinkable it's, it's possible to, to do, but it's unthinkable in terms of its consequences. So we depend upon, we've got in our pockets this little device uh, called the, the iPhone or the Huawei phone or uh, the uh, Samsung phone, whatever it is. We have in this little device all of the knowledge in the world in our hands. So it's really up to us to educate ourselves to say nothing is inevitable until it happens. Mm -hmm. And we can prevent the inevitable by making choices now that avoid that trap, that avoid the uh, potential for conflict or the inevitability of conflict. We don't have to have it. Earlier you were in the ceremonies remembering what your longtime friend John McCain, who passed away recently, we understand there has been a lot of debates about exactly the values that are important to America now. What would you say about him and this debate right now going on in your country? Well, uh, John McCain is one of our heroes. Uh, he was heroic in the sense that he uh, was flying during the war in uh, Vietnam, was shot down, was injured badly, uh, he was beaten badly, he spent uh, five and a half years in prison and was given a chance uh, for early uh, exit out and he refused. <clears throat> uh, being true to the code, uh, the, uh, the last in is the last out. And uh, he said, everybody that came in before me must leave first. And so he achieved heroic um, proportions in the minds of most people. But then he went on for public service and spent a good deal of his time, some of it in the House of Representatives, then in the Senate. And what he stood for was principle that we had core values, that we believed in a strong national defense, we believed in balanced budgets, we believed in human rights, we believed in the dignity of individuals, uh, and uh, he believed that we had to compromise, that we had to work with our fellow colleagues in the Senate. If they were Democrats who had good ideas, he was willing to work with them. So he reached across the aisle, as we like to say in Washington, was able to work with people of a different philosophical uh, uh, persuasion, mm -hmm. but could find common ground. But we understand he has been having some problems uh, with President Trump personally. Yes. And also this has led to further debate about exactly what is the values of Washington these days. Uh, of course, 
That is what the U.S. internal matter, as the Chinese always say. But what's important is what kind of United States is it presenting to the rest of the world. That is important to us also. Exactly. And that's why uh, so much of uh, world attention was turned on the funeral services for John McCain because it represented to many something of an era of passing, that uh, we don't have many like him anymore that was willing to stand up for the core values that he uh, represented. And President Trump, of course, had a personal uh, disagreement with um, John McCain and did not consider him to be a hero. And um, so that generated a lot of controversy in terms of people who felt that that was really a not an appropriate position to take with respect to John. But it, um, what, what's happened in, in, in Washington is the parties have become even more polarized. Republicans have moved further and further to the right. As a result, the Democrats are moving further to the left. So what used to be the kind of core middle, of which I like to think I uh, was part of, uh, is disappearing. There's not much left to the middle as such. And the middle represents compromise. Right. Uh, compromise is not a four-letter word. It's not a dirty word. It's something, if you believe in the art of government, mm. it means that you have to uh, find common ground with people who have different views. And compromise is also the key word when it comes to trade negotiations, in a way. It comes to our dealing with China, uh, for example. You have a different philosophy uh, in terms of how you see trade uh, than we do. Uh, we can p uh, plant our, um, our flags in, uh, in cement and then... Uh, never reach an agreement. Never reach an agreement, never reaching any kind of a consensus saying, we understand what, uh, what you're trying to achieve, you must understand what we're trying to achieve. How do we come together? Mm -hmm. uh, that is what needs to be done, and that's why the China Development Forum uh, is so important that you have people coming. Unfortunately, we're classified as the elite. <laughs> I come from pretty humble background, uh, and yet it's part of the American dream, and I would suggest it's part of the Chinese dream as well, and that is you give people the opportunity to be the best that they can be. Right. So you can come from very humble beginnings and rise to the top. That's what we call the American dream. Barack Obama was a classic case of that. Who would have thought that someone of his background could be president of the United States? And so I think it's true of, of the Chinese people as well. And as you know, I uh, give a lecture every year at Nankai University. That's right. And I look at those students and I say, you can be whatever you want to be. I remember last time our conversation is about leadership when it comes to the end. And I would pose the same question to you now because things have been really changing since last time we talked. So Secretary Khan, being considered as a great leader when you were serving for the administration earlier, what do you think should be the qualities of leadership these days in Washington and, if you can, also in Beijing? Well, number one, knowledge. Uh, number two, understanding. Uh, number three, um, humility. Uh, and four, willing to uh, reach agreement with someone or some country uh, that uh, may not share your entire viewpoint. Secretary Kong always wonderful to talk to someone who is such an open-minded leader. You're always a challenge to deal with. <laughs> <laughs>
I recently sat down with Merit Ng, Canadian Minister on Small Enterprise and Export Promotion. She's a Chinese Canadian who was born in Hong Kong. She told me that Canada believes strongly in free trade, especially for its small and medium sized enterprises. Canadian officials are working around the clock with their U.S. counterparts to keep NAFTA intact. The U.S. has set September 30th as the deadline. The two sides still disagree on major issues, and Canada has urged more flexibility from the U.S. And certainly Canada believes that both Canada and the United States would be better off if these inappropriate tariffs on Canadian softwood lumber were to be removed. Last month, President Trump reached a preliminary agreement with Mexico to replace the 24-year-old North American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA was a disaster, and we've changed it around. However, NAFTA's third member, Canada, was excluded from their bilateral accord. The uncertainty regarding NAFTA has already hurt investor confidence in Canada, but a bigger threat looms over its economy. Trump said he might impose a 25% tariff on Canadian auto exports, which is one of Canada's most important industries. Because I love Canada. But they've taken advantage of our country for many years. They have tremendous, tremendous uh, trade barriers, and they have tremendous tariffs. NAFTA covers the largest free trade area in the world, encompassing 1.2 trillion U.S. dollars in annual trade. Despite NAFTA's vital role in the Canadian economy, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau has reiterated that Canada will not make too many concessions. I said from the very beginning, no NAFTA deal is better than a bad NAFTA deal. Uh, and we are going to remain uh, firm on, uh, on that principle because Canadians expect us uh, to stand up for them and that's exactly what this government is going to do. Canada is one of the United States' closest allies and trading partners. Last year, 76% of Canada's exports went to the U.S. Since Trump took office, he has already imposed tariffs on Canadian steel, aluminum and solar panels. One study found that if NAFTA were to disappear, the Canadian economy would contract by 2.2%, while the effect would be much smaller for the United States. Madam Minister, what a pleasure to have you on CGTN. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you so very much. We understand the trade disputes going on between China and the United States. We also understand Canada is trying to work on a trilateral trade negotiation result. Madam Minister, what do you think about the prospect? Well, um, we're working very hard at, uh, you know, at an agreement uh, you know, with uh, the United States and Mexico. Free trade is really important to Canada. And uh, uh, not unlike uh, the present situation, uh, you know, we have had uh, uh, you know, tariffs uh, levied against uh, our steel and aluminum. And I can say that, you know, that we will always, as a government, stand up for our workers and stand up for Canadian businesses uh, in Canada. Having said that, though, while you are standing up for the businesses, one would assume that there might be some challenges both for the general economic picture and also for the future world's concept about global trade. Yes, of course. I mean, you know, Canada is a trading country. We believe in free trade and we believe in a rules-based system. Um, we Whose will... rule is it? I think it's, uh, it's, you know, I think it's the world's rule. I mean, I think it's, uh, we've benefited from a rules-based system. We have benefited as a country in job creation through free trade. So it's really important for us to keep opening access, greater access into markets for our Canadian businesses. But how could you do that? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, our government, uh, you know, has uh, concluded a trade agreement with uh, the European Union through CETA. In Parliament, uh, my colleague minister, uh, you know, has uh, proceeded to ratify the CPTPP in our Canadian Parliament, meaning that uh, that we will uh, we will be trading with uh, the Asian Pacific countries about 13 countries, so really important for, uh, for Canadian small businesses and medium-sized businesses so that they can have access to these customers in these global markets. Right. Having heard all of this, Madam Minister, it seems that you are suggesting, with the efforts coming from Canada, that the world picture of trade and trade mechanism actually could be facing a dramatic change. Can you help us to grasp the real nature of this transformation? 
for us in Canada, you know, as I said, we are a trading country, and uh, and having our people put into trade agreements is really important. The trade agreements that we have negotiated of recent, you know, have chapters in it that actually provide access to markets for our small and medium-sized businesses, but it also provides access, uh, you know, to women entrepreneurs and women-led businesses as well. So having, uh, you know, having our societies considered and be a part of those trade agreements is a very important thing for uh, the prosperity of Canadian businesses, but, uh, but all businesses. Mm -hmm. How do you see the fact that some of the biggest economies in the world are retreating from the global system, at least apparently for now, whether it's a negotiation tactic mm -hmm. or it is a long-term nature of those economies, we don't know for this moment. What does it mean for all of us? And as a result, how are we going to adjust and at the same time thrive? You know, Canada will always you know advocate against protectionism we will always advocate for you know open uh, markets and greater access for uh, you know for our uh, for our businesses uh, abroad a successful negotiation of uh, you know of a of trade agreements in you know in the, with the European Union or with uh, you know with CPTPP and in fact Canada is the only G7 country that has a free trade agreement with every other G7 country mm. so I would say that uh, that this is something that we work hard to do and uh, and this is the kind of access that uh, that our country uh, will want our businesses to have access to those markets and uh, that's how we're going to be able to create the kind of growth that uh, we are looking for for our small and medium-sized businesses in Canada. Which is going to benefit you more and your constituency? Is it only bilateral or it is going to be a combination bilateral, multilateral, trilateral, you name it? Well, I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, trade diversification is, uh, is a portfolio that, uh, that uh, my colleague minister has. And uh, this is sort of why I'm here as well, right? I mean, this is a good time to diversify. It's a good time to uh, make sure that we keep exploring opportunities around the world and that we keep exploring uh, and securing greater access to these markets and to these customers for our Canadian businesses. On the other hand, at the time of challenge, given what is happening right now, to you, what are some of the priorities of your work? Right. Uh, I'm thrilled to be the Minister for Small Business and Export Promotion. Small and medium-sized businesses are really important to middle-class Canadians, really important to uh, our economy. They're 90, you know, 90 percent of our businesses are small and medium-sized businesses in Canada. So my job is really, you know, the way I describe it is I help businesses start, I help them grow and scale, and I help them find access to international markets. You're a babysitter. <laughs> well, a I would like to see a proud babysitter and a servant. Growth. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, a proud supporter of all our small and medium-sized businesses. Their growth means uh, means economic prosperity for uh, for Canadians and uh, for our Canadian middle class. Mm -hmm. For Canadian small and medium-sized companies, Chinese medium-sized companies, uh, and others, uh, one of the biggest challenge is they don't have the bargaining power individually. However, when putting together with the support of the government and with the support of the right idea of global trade, they could thrive. But the thing is how to put them together and also how to think beyond boundaries. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Um, you know, I was here, uh, you know, even while in China, I uh, was able to meet with a number of Canadian entrepreneurs. And it's interesting because I met them here in China. And why is this really important? It's really important because the part of my portfolio, which is about expert promotion, is really to help these small and medium-sized com companies find opportunities so that they can grow their enterprises in global markets. So speaking to Canadian entrepreneurs, the small and medium-sized businesses, as I, you know, as I have done, uh, is really encouraging because they are growing and they're growing globally. Uh, a Canadian enterprise with, uh, with uh, you know, Canadian research and development, but they are finding customers and co-locating. But what if they are facing difficulties overseas? Your largest neighbor, for example, is an interesting case study. Uh, currently, how are you helping your small and medium-sized companies to go through this uh, apparently at least mm -hmm. difficult times? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, domestically at home, my job is to help small and medium-sized businesses become export ready so that they can take advantage of the trade agreements that we have completed and the market access abroad. And then we also, what I like to call, 
Canada's best sales force. So we have the Trade Commissioner Services that operate 160 offices all around the world. This is Canada's best sales force because they operate in the world and they are able to help our Canadian SMEs understand the market, the customers, and how best to access uh, how best to access that and uh, and put financing together to help them scale and grow into into these international markets. China and Canada have been working together on trade and many other issues, but many ask the question, at this crucial juncture, can the two countries, together with the others, be inspiring and aspiring enough? Yeah, you know, uh, Canada and China have a, you know, a deep relationship and a strong friendship. And uh, we already are doing some really exciting initiatives uh, together. I mean, we have... Uh, we have signed uh, uh, a joint agreement on climate change, and we have also uh, signed an agreement around agriculture exports, uh, uh, exports and imports. So, and this year actually is 2018 uh, as a result of the Prime Minister's trip here in 2016. This year is Canada is the year of Canada-China tourism. So, there are many things that we are already working at as a country, and we will continue to have explore, continue that work, and continue the exploration of collaborating together. Madam Minister, you might be much more well aware than many of the others that China and Canada established the diplomatic relations very early in the day mm -hmm. because Canada was the very first so-called Western country mm -hmm. to de establish diplomatic mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. with China. And it was during the Trudeau senior yes. administration. Mm -hmm. Many in China and in Canada remember those yes. historical moments mm -hmm. very well. Um, Having said that, though, we are in Trudeau Junior administration, and people wonder what's likely to be the strength that this administration to put into the bilateral relations. Right. Well, you know, China and Canada, you're right, has a deep history and a fond history. It takes a lot of political guts to do it at that time. Indeed, indeed. And, um, and you know, when I look at, uh, at where we are today, China is Canada's second largest trading partner. Uh, just in this last year alone, uh, our bilateral trade was about $100 billion. And uh, Chinese Canadians are a, uh, they're an important fabric of the Canadian society. Absolutely. You know, there's 1.6 million Chinese Canadians in Canada from coast to coast to coast. So the people to people relationship uh, really is a platform or a cornerstone for us to keep uh, working on our, uh, you know, on our friendship, but also on our on our economic collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there is uh, there is wonderful opportunity ahead. What are you suggesting? Well, what I'm suggesting is uh, what we've already started doing, right? I mean, we've already entered into, you know, into discussions, uh, and uh, and we will continue to, you know, the two countries to work to find ways to, you know, to, to, to work together, perhaps towards a free trade agreement, but we certainly have already uh, started those and we will continue to do that work. Mm -hmm. Is there any agenda or any timetable for starting a conversation related to exactly the topic you just mentioned? I would say that, uh, that the work has already started and, uh, and any work that we're going to do will always be done in the interests, uh, you know, uh, to the interests, uh, you know, for Canadians and, uh, and, for, the and for the Chinese as well. So, so uh, for the win-win. It is a win-win. The win-win, what does it mean for the Canadians? What are the most important priorities? I think that, uh, you know, speaking as the Minister for Small Business and, uh, uh, and Expert Promotion, you know, for me, a win-win is, uh, is making sure that I am fully behind uh, and being the biggest cheerleader and uh, champion for the growth of our small and medium-sized businesses in mm -hmm. Canada. Talking about China-Canada relationship, mm -hmm. we also see these two countries at this great juncture of time having the guts to speak out. That, many say, is also very important in today's world. Do you think Canada will still be able to do that in this administration, despite maybe some of the challenges from your neighbors? Well, I mean, you know, uh, Canadians expect uh, its Canadian government and leadership to, uh, you know, to speak out and, uh, and to affirm Canadian values. 
So whether that is, uh, you know, domestically or, you know, or abroad, uh, I think that uh, Canadians can be uh, comforted by the fact that, uh, that their government will always speak, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in consistent with Canadian and Canadian values. Belt and Road Initiative, Madam Minister, is an important idea that China uh, provided to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, it is also inviting partners to work together on this idea. How is Canada looking at this idea? I know Canada is participating in AIIB, mm -hmm. and also Canada has been working on with China to develop in a third-party country. Mm -hmm. But how does it work from now on? Well, I think that uh, that our continued uh, dialogue, which we have at all levels of government between Ch Canada and China, is a perfect way to be able to continue those exploratory discussions between our two countries. Madam Minister, you is a crystallization <laughs> of Asian Canadians and the role that the Asian Canadians have been playing in the Canadian society. You yourself was born in Hong Kong, in fact. I was, yes. So what was it like to be from a Hong Kong girl transforming herself into a minister currently working for this administration, which very much emphasized, of course, on women's role and also on equity coming from different kinds of ethnic groups. Right. Well, you know, I'm very proud to be a part of uh, an administration, you know, led by Prime Minister Trudeau and to be a part of his gender balanced cabinet. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, and as a, you know, as a Chinese Canadian, someone who grew up from Hong Kong. I think I'm going to give a bit of the credit to my own dad because yeah. the Prime Minister, uh, you know, um, speaks of himself as a feminist, and I would like to say that, you know, that I regard my father as a bit of a feminist. I mean, in Chinese culture, you know, and I would think that at the time that I was born, he actually, you know, probably had uh, some conflicting ideals, right? I mean, uh, he believed always that a girl could do anything that a boy could do, and essentially instilled that in me. And uh, and I'd like to think that uh, that. That certainly set me up to a path of being able to, uh, you know, to, to aspire and uh, and to work hard and uh, and believe that uh, that if you work hard and you aspire, that uh, that anything really is possible. And I hope that by taking on this role now as a cabinet minister in this, you know, in this government, that uh, that there are going to be a lot of women like me and a lot of Chinese women like me who feel that participating and working hard. Uh, they can follow a path way better than, you know, way better than mine. You're very modest, uh, <laughs> Madam Minister. Having said that, though, uh, how do you see about the so-called uh, old immigrants and the new immigrants coming from Canada, particularly from the mainland? Uh, there has been a wave mm -hmm. of them and also the Chinese students right now mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful uh, to have, uh, you know, to have the... Um, the diversity of, uh, of, of people in Canada. I think that, uh, that recent immigrants or Chinese students have, you know, have done well uh, you know, in, in Canada is simply because we are a country that embraces you know, inclusivity and diversity. And, uh, and, so and hard work as and well. And hard work. So, uh, so I think that they, that they do find commonalities uh, you know, and, uh, and find settling and uh, participating and, and, uh, and being educated in, uh, in Canada uh, something that uh, is a really positive experience for them. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insights CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Gina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.